Ladies and gentlemen, it is finally time to build the $1,000 gaming PC. I'm going to be showing off exactly how to build this computer, all of the parts featured and why we're using them, and of course we'll show you those all important gameplay benchmark numbers. So buckle your seatbelts for what should be a very reasonably priced ride, after a short word from this video sponsor. Want to learn to code? It has never been easier, all thanks to Boolean. Boolean is the software engineering course that not only teaches you to code, but also helps you find your first job in tech. If you don't find one within six months, you can get a full refund with their money back guarantee. With significantly cheaper fees than universities, this six month course focuses on modern languages like React and TypeScript, and is taught by professional software engineers that provide true one-to-one -one support. Absolutely no prior experience is necessary, and PC-centric viewers can even get 500 pounds off. Learn a little bit more with that link down below. We will of course start all the way at the beginning, which means we can put our 6600 XT for aside for a second, and actually we're not going for AMD with the motherboard, oh no. This exact model is from ASRock, it is the Steel Legend, and it's very reasonably priced in the UK at around about £140 at the time of filming. But don't let that put you off too much, because you've got all the features that you need, including PCI Generation 4 for both the graphics card and the SSD, you've got a USB-C header, which is really important for the case that we'll be using, but more on that in a bit, but then you also have another one around the back on the Board itself, so it's actually quite future proof. This be aware that if you use a 10th generation CPU in this, then this top slot probably isn't going to work because it's only compatible with 11th gen. And speaking of 11th generation CPUs, what do we have here? This is the i5 11400F, and this is not the most powerful gaming processor out there, but when it comes to value for money at the moment, this is pretty much your best bet if you want all of the modern features that also come along with this. It's a six core chip, so it should work with pretty much all games today and most of them tomorrow. I'd be very interested to see how this fares with Battlefield 6 when this comes out, but for the system that we're building here today, I think this is gonna be ideal. So let's open up our box and then carefully remove the CPU. Please don't damage this, otherwise your PC is gonna have a bit of a hard time booting. Don't take this plastic cover off, instead just raise this metal lever and lift the whole thing up, again being very careful not to actually touch the pins themselves, and then just gently rest this in place with the gold arrows lining up to the one on the motherboard, then you lower down the CPU cover again, click it into place, and then this little plastic bit actually pops off. Save it for ROM, later ROM. Now comes the bit in the video where I'm going to get hit with a little bit of shade, because we are actually using the stock CPU cooler. <gasps> How dare you! Because this PC comes in at around about $980 or so without any additional cooling. So if you've got that $20, $30, maybe even $40 spare, then you can either upgrade the case fans and make your PC look a little bit more pretty, or you can do what I would absolutely suggest and what I would do personally, which would be to upgrade your CPU cooler to something that doesn't sound like a jet's taking off whenever you get gaming. However, this is a visual medium. I want this video to look good. You clicked on this thumbnail, so hopefully the PC looked good too which means I'm spending that extra 45, I think, dollar budget on the case fans. These are very budget friendly. They're from Deepcool. These are the CF120 Plus. They come with a kit that gives you everything you need to get started. And realistically, it is gonna help to cool your graphics card, so you're gonna get lower noise from that. And ultimately, upgrading your CPU cooler in a month's time is so easy, you can just do both when you get your next paycheck. But it seems I can't put this off forever. Let's grab our tiny little stock CPU cooler with the smallest amount of thermal paste ever, actually. Just grab your CPU cooler and then push these little pins into the holes. You want to make sure all of these pins have been poked through properly and it is actually a little bit more fiddly than it looks which is quite annoying because you push one in and then it just comes out the other side. But when you're done it shouldn't wiggle about at all. Then you can just grab your CPU cable and then you just plug it in at the top right hand corner like so. Next up, it's time for the memory, or the RAM, and we're saving ourselves a little bit of money here with a kit from Corsair. This is Vengeance LPX, so there's no RGB here. It still looks good though, and it works with pretty much any CPU cooler because it is so low profile. Rather annoyingly, the only kit that I have in the studio is this 32 gigabyte kit running at 4600 megahertz, but obviously that would be ludicrous for a build like this. Instead, you should grab 16 gigabytes, so two times eight, running at a speed of maybe 32 or 3600 megahertz, and that is of course what we've priced up for. It's not that 32 gigabytes isn't better, it's just that it's completely redundant really for gaming, it's not going to give you any extra FPS in the vast majority of titles. The only real exception is if you're doing a lot of work on the side, anything that needs a lot of RAM, obviously then that would make sense, but for a gaming PC, stick with 16. I've got a really sore foot at the moment actually, because I twisted my ankle on the dog walk this morning, me being silly, 
Not sure why that's relevant to this video, just thought you might want to know. It probably would be a whole lot more useful if I actually showed you how to install this. It's really simple, you just push it into place, line up the grooves, and you use slots 2 and slots 4, just like this, to make sure that you're getting the maximum speed, and this is something that we call dual channel memory. Okay, it's definitely not the best looking motherboard combo that I've ever put together, but to be honest with you, I still think it looks really good. I love the look of this motherboard, and actually the black CPU cooler with the black RAM sort of matches. PC Centric has once again managed to actually theme something properly. Yes! You will of course need some form of storage to actually install Windows on and actually have all of your games. The one that we're using here is definitely the best value one I think you can get at the moment. It is a PCI Generation 3 SSD, so it's pretty quick, but it's not Gen 4, so you could go quicker. This is 500 gigabytes, which is gonna be good for a starter drive, but again, you probably need some more storage a little bit later down the line. But this one at the moment goes for around about $50, which I think is a steal. You'll need a slightly smaller screwdriver for this, and then you just remove the PCIe slot cover on the M.2 SSD, which is right here at the top. Then just line up the little grooves with the slot on the motherboard, grab the PCIe slot cover, and then just place this back on top as you found it and screw it into place. While we're doing this, if you do want more info on my sore foot, essentially I just twisted my ankle when I decided to go off piste. I decided it would be a good idea to start running through some rough and clearly it wasn't because I was on the floor like, ow, referee, red card. And the dog was like, what? Awesome stuff then, we are now ready to proceed, which means we can pup our pup. We can pup our motherboard aside for one second, but it is now time to actually talk about the case itself. And this is actually my favorite case I think most people should go for at the moment. This is the Corsair 4000D. It won my best case award, which isn't actually a real thing, but don't worry about that. This is available for around about 80-ish dollars or so. It does depend which model you go for. You can get a tempered glass one, which does look good, but I think the airflow variant personally is a lot better. It is really well constructed this, and you've got so much airflow that you can put pretty much any component in this, and they will stay nice and cool. There's also very good cable management around the back as well, so you can get a build that is very tidy. You've got USB Type-C on the front, as we mentioned earlier, so this is very future-proof. The only thing that I don't really like about it, but it's sort of fair for the money, is that the case fans that you get don't really look that impressive, which is why I would strongly recommend that you do upgrade them to something a little bit more pretty when you can afford it. The front just pops off with a couple of clicks and then reveals a bit of a dust filter, and then you can actually access this fan. We're gonna move this and put it up top. It's all very easy. It's just four screws and then the fan itself should just pop out. You've got another dust filter on the front of the case and then you can see you've got all of these fan mounts or if you want to use a radiator for like an all-in-one cooler you'd probably put this at the top as well. Fans obviously do have a direction or an orientation in which the air will actually blow so there is actually a little arrow at the top of the fan and what I'm going to want to do is have this as an exhaust so all of the cool air is going to come in through the front with these three new fans but then when it gets to the top it's going to be vented out the top and out the back. Now that that's in place, we can grab our IO shield and you don't actually see these that much anymore, but essentially this just lines up with the back of your case and then outlines exactly where all of those ports are gonna be. I would usually lay the whole case flat for this, but I want you to actually see what I'm doing. So I'm just gonna get this motherboard. I'm gonna line it up with this little central pin there. And then you've got screw holes all the way around that you use the screws that you'll quite neatly find in the preloaded hard drive bay for you, all ready to go. It is all very self-explanatory stuff. But I suppose if it's not, you could just do the normal thing, which is to read the manual, though technically I'm the manual manual labor. I'm genuinely quite excited to test these fans because I haven't actually used them before so they could be a disaster or they could be amazing but the quality of them does actually seem to be pretty good. Definitely a lot better than your standard Corsair case fan. They need to be quiet and they need to look good. That sounds like the sort of thing someone would put on their Tinder bio doesn't it? I don't think they'd get on with me very well would they? Wow! How? How much health did he have? Did you see how many shots I had on him? It's all coming along quite nicely, if I do say so myself. But now we do have all of these fans installed, we need to actually get them plugged in to the motherboard. The first one that we're using here is just by the PCIe slots. Then we can do the same with all of the rest. You'll find our extra case fan at the top, but then the slightly fancier RGB ones actually do have four pin, which means they're PWM, you can control them better. And ultimately you can get a quieter PC when your PC's not really doing anything. For the Mass Effect fans out there, I guess you could say you could assume direct control. I was about to moan then that all of the fan cables were really short and it is still annoying, but it's because they do give you this little fan hub in the box as well. So even if you don't have enough headers 
on your motherboard, then you're not stuck. Of course, the fans do also use RGB, so you've got to plug that lighting control in. Back in the day, you used to have one cable that did everything, but then it meant if you wanted a low fan speed but high RGB, you just couldn't do it. So this just makes it a whole lot easier. You get this little hub, and then you plug your cables into there, and then this goes straight into your motherboard. Or if you want to do manual control, you can use this little manual controller. It's like you've got a PowerPoint presentation. Next slide, please. Once you have got that sorted out, just run the cable up here at the top, find your addressable RGB header, which is this gray one, and then just lay it in over the top. Then you can move on to the bigger cables. We've got our USB 3 for the front panel. We've also got USB-C, again, for the front panel. If you're using an analog headset, then you want to plug this one called HD Audio in. And then you've got these little tiny weeny connectors, and these are for your power switch, power LED, and the reset button. USB 3 and USB C are these connections over here on the right hand side of the motherboard. USB C is just above it. The front panel connections are always the fiddliest bits, but it's this little block down here. And then finally, you do have your HD audio, and this is always the bottom left hand side of the motherboard, just here. But do be aware that it's not worth plugging this in until you've got the power supply in, because quite often you just have to unplug it and do it after anyway. And here we've got one from Cooler Master, and this is pretty much the budget build's dream, really. This is the MWE white 600 watts so it's definitely not the most efficient one out there but it's still pretty efficient it provides more than enough power for a rig and probably any future upgrade too the only thing that you do need to be aware of is that this is a non-modular power supply so all of these cables do actually come attached so it's going to be a little bit more tricky to cable manage but in a case this size to be honest again not really a big deal grab your power supply make sure the fan is facing downwards if it does actually work in this orientation as long as we've got airflow at the bottom you should be aware though that this is actually only available in Europe. I guess it has something to do with your fancy electronics over in the US. So if you're looking for something equivalent, I think there's a MWE Bronze 550 watts. That is roughly about the same price. Or you just go big and get the 650. Loads of cables, but remember you don't need to plug them all in. You can't miss the very large ATX connector. This just goes above the USB that you've already plugged in. The one that's labeled as CPU is of course for the CPU, which is probably helpful, but it doesn't actually tell you where the connection is on the motherboard. But fortunately, you've got me. It is here at the top left. The ones that say PCIe, you're gonna need for the graphics card. So you may as well get these in place to sort of bring these through and rest them at the bottom of the case. And then this is the annoying bit. You can see we're left with all all of these cables that we don't need. We don't have any SATA devices here, not even the RGB hub could we plug that into the motherboard. So all of these you're just gonna have to sort of stuff down at the bottom in the hard drive cage. Not a big deal, but you can see why a modular power supply will make sense if you can stomach the extra cost. You're just gonna have to give these a good old stuff down here at the bottom. Don't worry about being nice to them either, they deserve it. Which leaves us with one final component, the most exciting part of our build, the brand new 6600 XT. This is aimed at 1080p gaming, but don't worry if you have a 1440p display, because I would imagine this is going to be fine for most games. Obviously, the standard of PC gaming these days has moved towards high refresh rates, which is why this is firmly marketed as a 1080p card. It has 8GB of memory, which isn't as much as other AMD GPUs. The exact model that we're using is actually from ASRock, and I don't think I've ever used an ASRock graphics card before, but they're getting more and more popular. I guess that my main concern with this really is twofold. Firstly, that you're not going to get DLSS with this, which isn't going to matter too much going into the future as AMD's FSR does catch up. But at the moment, if you want to play something like Warzone, then an NVIDIA graphics card is clearly going to be a better choice for the time being. But then secondly, pricing and availability. I have priced this whole rig up at current prices other than the graphics card, which is at MSRP, because there's not really any other way I can do it at the moment. Ultimately, like pretty much all graphics cards in this generation, if you can see one for a great price, especially if it is MSRP, pick it up and you won't regret it. But let us get this thing installed. We start by removing the two slot covers that you'll find on the back of the case. Grab the graphics card and then just gently line this up with the slots and then give it a good old push until it clicks into place. It's very satisfying. Then just screw it back down, grab your PCIe power connection and then connect this at the top. There we have, I think actually a very good looking rig, despite the fact that some of our components aren't as fancy as they could be. I think the GPU itself actually is pretty attractive. It's a nice length. It sort of goes with the rest of our theme and I guess the size of the case. The only thing that comes to mind to need changing sooner rather than later is of course to actually add a CPU cooler, something like the Hyper 212, incredibly popular. This is around about $30, $40. But if you want something that looks even better, then you can spend a bit more and make your PC, well, look a whole lot better. I almost completely forgot to show you the back. This is with pretty much no cable management. This is one cable tie here. So you can see the case itself just handles everything with grace. But will it handle games with grace? Let's find out. 
We will grab ourselves a high refresh rate 1080p monitor. This is the HP Omen 25i. They sent this out for a separate sponsored video. The only thing really that comes to mind that I don't like about this is the fact that the stand doesn't actually have any height adjust, which is a little bit silly, but you could get a third party stand, mount it, and make it look a whole lot better. Plug in all of the cables, which for now is just gonna be keyboard, mouse, power, and actually getting everything from the monitor. And then, moment of truth, we should be able to turn this on. Oh, those fans are very bright, aren't they? They look quite similar to the LLs, actually, just a little bit of a smaller ring. The graphics card looks really good as well, actually. Again, going with the rest of our system, I quite like this RGB plate you've got at the front. Although, actually, why is it that only one of the fans is RGB? That is weird. Something else that's weird is that the PC doesn't seem to be working first time. We've got this horrible, ominous red light at the bottom. It says DRAM, which means there's a problem with our memory. I imagine it's just that it's trying to run it at a speed that it can't quite handle. Remember, this is a stupidly fast kit. Not to worry, we'll give it a reset and see if we can fix it. To do this, we're going to need a screwdriver. We turn our PC off, we wait around about 15 seconds. Then we find a small little header next to the front panel connections and we short these pins for five seconds. We turn it back on and hopefully this has now cleared the CMOS so everything in the memory has been reset to its factory settings and it should now actually load up with the RAM. Your PC should then boot into the BIOS. It'll look something like this. It will vary depending on the vendor that you go for. You can enable XMP to get your memory to run at its full rated speed. You can go over to Fantastic Tuning and tune all of your fans for noise levels, which I would highly advise doing. And then you can also find Resize Bar Support here to get a little bit more performance out of that graphics card. I've set the memory to 3200 megahertz to make this fair. I don't want to use a stupidly fast kit that will give you duff numbers. But then you can grab a copy of Windows that you'll have lying around in a drawer somewhere, plug it in the back, then follow all of the on-screen instructions to get Windows installed, then you're ready to game. We're here! We made it! We're ready to get gaming! Overall, I think this is an absolutely fantastic looking system, and I really can't stress enough just how good looking those fans are on the front. Yes, they are cheaper than some alternatives, but honestly, you would never know it based on the performance. As long as you tune these things, everything is very quiet. Having said that, the stock cooler is worse than I remember. It is making an absolute racket. And it's such a shame because everything else is just so nice and quiet. If you look at our CPU temperatures at the moment, we're getting around about 70 degrees. But every time it goes near 75, this thing just sort of blasts up and it sounds like a jet's taking off. Let's quite literally jump into some Fortnite though. And this is a game that runs very well at 1080p. We're getting pretty much 100 frames a second. It is going to deviate a little bit, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, depending on where and when I guess you are in the game. This this is running at absolute max settings, which is the epic preset, but I definitely should say that if you're playing this on an Nvidia card like the RTX 3060, I do think that your frame rate may well be a little bit higher because you get DLSS technology, and unfortunately there isn't any FSR on this game at the moment, but bearing in mind this is probably the most popular game on PC at the moment, I'm going to say it's not going to be too long before we see full support. Placing 6th wasn't too bad, but why don't we go for something a lot more intense, and Cyberpunk 2077. I've said it before and I'll say it again, this is a game that isn't really a huge fan of AMD graphics cards. It's certainly not that you can't play the game, but if you want to play with all of the bells and whistles enabled, so this is Ray Tracing Ultra, you can see that at the moment it's not really that much more than a photography masterclass. Therefore, you are going to have to go into the settings and to be honest, you're just going to have to turn Ray Tracing off entirely. You can see the difference immediately. Over 60 frames a second, this is a very happy medium to be honest with you. You've still got max settings across the board, it's just that Ray tracing that you're going to turn off and to be honest with you after you've been playing the game for around about 15 minutes you're probably not going to be too concerned to be honest with you. Now Hitman 3 is a very interesting game for a number of reasons. Firstly it is very good looking but if you look at that frame rate you can see we're getting over 120 frames a second so this is going to feel remarkably smooth and if you want to play with guns or doing it properly and be a bit more stealthy I think you're going to be very happy. However, this is also a game that does require quite a lot of CPU horsepower. You can see looking at our GPU, we're hitting around about 80-82%. Just be aware that in certain areas of the game you might see slightly lower frame rates because the CPU just won't be able to keep up with all the people and physics that it has to render at the same time. It's now time to look at some high refresh rate gaming with some Valorant. I should have been paying attention.
I'll start by saying that we're clearly not struggling for FPS here with around about 200 frames a second, which already fully saturates this 165Hz monitor, so gameplay feels remarkably smooth and extremely responsive. But if you really are a true eSports pro and you want to play professionally, then you would look to get a better CPU, because clearly our graphics card, again, isn't being properly utilised here. I wouldn't say this is a problem, so don't let this put you off. Something like an i7 or a Ryzen 7 is going to make a fair bit of difference, assuming you can stomach the extra cost. And I think that leaves us with room for one more game, my personal favourite, some Apex Legends. We're playing ranked arenas here, absolutely no mucking about whatsoever. Start with a flat line every time, apart from rounds two onwards. There is actually a frame rate cap in Apex Legends. It's 144 or 165, depending on what monitor you have. It is very easy to remove with an advanced launch option, but it's not really necessary, so I think you are going to dip ever so slightly into the 150s. Either way, though, this is a really smooth gaming experience. If you do want to play high refresh rate 1080p, clearly AMD have hit the mark here. All in all, if you can actually get this for the price that they're selling it for, then I think it is worth picking up. Just be aware that you're not going to get those specific NVIDIA features, and I think it is going to take a while for AMD to actually catch up with the full software support. If you do want to check out current pricing on anything featured in this rig, then as always, you can check those out with my Amazon affiliate links listed down below. And of course, while you're down there, please do check out Boolean. I personally studied web tech at uni and did love it, but it was so much money, and honestly, I just ended up self-teaching myself pretty much everything anyway. All you need to have is a will to succeed and a logical thinking brain, and I'm pretty sure you have that already. To change your life forever and help you land that dream job, check out Boolean today with that link down below and even save £500 off. Smash the like button, get yourself subscribed, and I'll see you in the next one.